from the solar system. And it was discovered in 1995 by a pair of Swiss astronomers. So now, coming back to this image, showing just a fraction of the stars in our Milky Way, it becomes apparent how many potential planetary systems there are around which we could search for life. Right? So if you take a rough estimate of the number of planets per star in the galaxy, which is about one, so on average, each star in the galaxy has about one planet. If we take that estimate, we can guess that there are about 10 to the 22 planets in the observable universe. Right? So this is 22 zeros, right? An unfathomably, unfathomably large number, right? So I can try to put this into context, but I'm going to fail. But here we go. <coughs> this number of planets is a million times more planets than the number of words that have been uttered by humans in the history of humankind. Right? So, it's a big number. And before we can start to study this big number of planets, these 10 to 22 planets, first we have to find them. But finding them can be really difficult for a couple of reasons. And the first is that stars are really big, and planets tend to be really small. So take for example our solar system. So here's Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system. And its diameter is already 10 times smaller than the Sun. Then for the Earth, the Earth is about 100 times smaller than the Sun. So in addition to stars being big and planets being small, the stars at night are big and bright, where the planets are small and dim, right? So planets tend to be somewhere between 10,000 to over a billion times dimmer than their stars, making them really tough to see. So instead of looking for the planets themselves, we have to use indirect methods of finding them. And there are two main methods of finding extra planets. The first one is called the transit method. So in the transit method, imagine you have okay, a bright star and a planet orbiting around it. But instead of the orientation of the planet's orbit being face on the way it is here, instead imagine that we rotate the orientation of the orbit 90 degrees such that its orbit is exactly edge on. And when it's edge on, the planet will actually transit it in front of the host star, causing the brightness of the star to dim for a short amount of time. And the amount of dimming, or the depth of the transit, tells you how big the planet is. Because you can imagine if the planet were a lot bigger, it would block more of the star's light, and you would get more dimming. So how deep this thing goes when the planet transits tells you how big the planet is. So here's an example of some real data. So this is the star's brightness over time. And there's a Jupiter-sized planet transiting this star. And you can see that there are six transit events that we see in this light curve, which are highlighted here by the blue arrows. So very, right, we have a star, a planet goes around, it transits once, goes around again, transits, goes around again, transits. And so the amount of time that you see between two adjacent transit events tells you the time it takes for the planet to go around the star. It tells you the planet's orbital period, or basically what a year is for the planet. Okay? And the orbital period itself, because of the way gravity works, also tells you the distance between the star and the planet. Which itself is really important, because depending on how far the planet is away from its whole star, that tells you how much stellar radiation the planet is receiving, which then tells you what the temperature of the planet is. So I'm going to step back for a second. And in the context of temperature, I'm going to define something really quick but really important, namely the habitable zone. Basically, where the temperature of the planet is such that it allows for liquid surface water. So each of these little guys here are a known exoplanet, or a planet, for you guys up here. And I'm showing you them in this space of their orbital distance, so how far away they are from their star, and as a function of the temperature of the host star. And so this central band that you see here, this is the habitable zone. It's the range of distances that a planet has to be from its host star such that water on its surface is likely to be in liquid form. So any planets that lie over here to the left of this band are going to be too close to their star, they're going to be too hot to have liquid surface water. Whereas any planets over here to the right of the band, of the habitable zone, are going to be too cold. Any liquid water oceans will likely be frozen over. 
So if you're interested in finding Earth-like life, you want liquid water oceans. You want to focus on planets within this habitable zone. And one of the most distinctive features that I want you to take away from this is how the habitable zone changes as you turn up the temperature of your star. So for these, dead, these really small, cold stars, the temperature, or the distance such that you get a planet's temperature to have liquid water, that distance is really small. You have to be very close to your star. Whereas as you turn the temperature of the star up towards sunlight stars, you have to move further out to get the right temperature to have liquid surface water. Okay? And so the first potentially habitable exoplanet, that is the first small Earth-like planet that we ever found within the habitable zone of its host star, is this guy right here. His name is Gliese 581c. And he has an orbital period of just 13 days. So the Earth, which is in the habitable zone of the Sun, has an orbital period of 365 days. This habitable zone planet has an orbital period of just 13 days. Meaning it's around one of those very small, one of those very cold stars. And it was discovered in 2007, again by some Swiss astronomers. But it wasn't found using the transit method. It was actually found using the second most important method we have for detecting and studying exoplanets, which we call the radial velocity method. So again, imagine that we have a star and we have a planet orbiting around it, except that that's not actually what's happening. Really what's happening is that both the star and the planet are orbiting around their common center of mass. And that's why the star seems a little bit offset here. So if I start to run this, you see that both these bodies orbit around the common center of mass. And so if you observe the star, we can actually see the wavelengths of light from that star shift. So as the star moves towards us, these wavelengths of light become blue-shifted, or they become squished together. The light gets red-shifted, or basically stretched apart. And this effect is periodic, right? Because the star is just going around the center of mass. And the amplitude of that variation, the amplitude of the variation in the star's shifting light, or in its radial velocity, tells us about the mass of the planet. So here's some actual RV data uh, for the star K218. And you can see this periodic variation from the orbiting planet K218c. And so the amplitude of this curve tells you the mass of K218c. And I've been saying K218c a lot. That's because K218c is a pretty dope planet. And <laughs> I actually found. Yeah. 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 So I did. I found K218C this summer. Um, so it's one of these really, um, really common super Earths, right? It's got a mass of about eight times the mass of the Earth, but it's it's way too hot to be happy. It's like 200 degrees on the surface, right? But the second planet, this foreground planet, is actually a happy zone. It's called K218B, and so this planet is one of the prime targets for searching for potential signs of life because it is within the habitable zone of its host star. Okay, so I've talked about two methods of studying exoplanets, the radial velocity method and the transit method. And so remember, the radial velocity method gives you the mass. The transit method gives you the radius. And so with those two measurements, we can start to be able to constrain the bulk composition of the planet, or basically its average density. So now we can start to tell whether or not a planet is Earth-like, whether it's made up of mostly rock and therefore very dense, or whether it's more Neptune-like, given that there might be some extended gaseous envelope on top of a solid core that makes the average density much lower. And so these are two things that we can measure if we can get the mass and if we can get the radius. And so, of course, the bulk composition is important if we want to search for Earth-like life because we want to look around Earth-like planets, namely ones whose bulk composition are consistent with the Earth, things that are made up of basically rock and iron, such that the planet is likely to have a solid surface over which you might be able to form a biosphere. Okay? So, now, can we classify a planet as being habitable just from what we can currently measure? Namely, we have the mass, we have the radius, and we have the orbit, right? The time it takes for the thing to go around. From those three measurements, can we classify a planet as habitable? No. No. A resounding no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it is. 
a resounding no, right? Because there are so many other factors that affect a planet's ability to harbor Earth like what? Uh, an example of one is the rotation of the planet, right? So does the planet rotate on its axis such that the stellar radiation that it receives gets uniformly distributed over the solid surface? Or maybe does the planet have a magnetic sphere? or a strong magnetic field that can shield the top of the planet's atmosphere from high energy particles. And maybe some other things. <laughs> yeah. So please, please, the long time, don't try and read this slide, right? The point of this slide is just tell you that there's all these factors, right? All these factors that we might need to form life. So maybe forming life on other planets is actually really hard, because you have to satisfy all of these very finely tuned conditions these conditions that we have here on Earth. But so now we're faced with the question of whether or not these finely tuned conditions can actually be replicated elsewhere in the galaxy. But remember, all of these aren't actually observable. And so what are some potentially observable signs of habitable world? Well, the first big one is the atmospheric structure or its composition. Namely, can we measure the chemistry of an exoplanet's atmosphere and search for chemical signs of life? Basically, chemical signs that there's a biosphere underneath the atmosphere. So on the Earth, the reason that there's molecular oxygen in the atmosphere of the Earth is basically because we have this vast amount of vegetation on the surface, and trees create oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis. That is why there's molecular oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. Secondly, can we look for large surface features? If we can actually detect photons from a planet, are we going to see that that signal is consistent with continents, or oceans, or clouds, those sort of things? And lastly, does the planet's atmosphere and surface features vary with time? Does it undergo seasonal variations the way it does on Earth? And if so, by how much does it change? So these are the sort of questions that we can try and answer via real observations. So, to start off, how can we measure an exoplanet's atmosphere? So we're going to focus on the exoplanet's atmosphere to start off. And again, what I mean by this is, how can we look for chemical signatures of life? Things that we call biosignatures. Things like water, right? Water from evaporating oceans, from oxygen produced by trees, or from methane, which is produced by cows, right? So cows actually, by their digestive processes, put out a lot, and I mean a lot, of methane, right? And they actually put out every day about as much methane as a car does. And so believe it or not, 99% of the methane in Earth's atmosphere is actually due to cows. <laughs> so, how can we study exoplanetary, at exoplanetary atmospheres? Well, I'm going to talk about this one way called atmospheric transmission spectroscopy. And I'm going to do it with this little schematic. So imagine, uh, so imagine that we have a telescope on the ground and we're going to observe some distant star in two wavelengths. We're going to use a blue filter and we're going to use a red filter. Next, imagine that this star has a transient Earth-like planet, <laughs> such that some of the radiation that the star is emitting gets absorbed by the rocky part of this Earth-like planet, because the Earth-like planet is completely opaque. Any of the radiation that hits it doesn't get through, so the star appears a little bit dimmer, and we observe a transit. Next, imagine that this Earth like planet has a tenuous atmosphere on top, but now this atmosphere doesn't absorb at all wavelengths equally because of the different chemicals that are in this atmosphere, and some absorb it this wavelength, and those absorb it that wavelength, and so on and so on. So, any of the photons, any of the star's light, that wants to travel through this atmosphere. Well, excuse me, some of it might not get all the way through, like the blue wavelength, right? And it's because the atmosphere happens to be really opaque at this blue wavelength, whereas some wavelengths might get all the way through, like the red wavelength, basically just because this particular atmosphere is not very opaque to that particular wavelength of light. So, if you observe the transit of this planet in the blue filter and in the red filter, the depth of that transit, i.e. the size of the planet, is going to be bigger in the blue wavelength. Because you're seeing the contribution from the rock and from the atmosphere. 
Whereas in the red, you're only seeing the contribution from the rod. Right? And the size of that signal scales with something called the atmospheric scale height, which is basically just a measure of how big the atmosphere is, which, again, depends on the temperature of the atmosphere, the surface gravity, surface gravity of the planet, and the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere, or the average, the average weight of the molecules that make up the atmosphere, essentially. And so the first transmission spectrum was actually obtained in 2002, but it was obtained for a Jupiter-sized planet. So of course, Jupiter is this big gas giant planet, right? And this particular Jupiter-sized exoplanet was really hot, so it has a really big atmosphere, making the observations relatively easy because it has a big atmospheric scale height. But what if we want to get a transmission spectrum of an Earth-like planet? Not so easy. Basically because the atmosphere of the Earth is really, really tiny. So you get really only a tiny increase in the size of the planet when you look at its transit. And that's illustrated here by this image taken by the, uh, the NASA uh, space shuttle program. This is a famous image called the thin blue line. So this thin blue line here is a few of the Earth's atmospheric scale lines. And you can see how friggin' small it is compared to the size of the full planet, right? So that extra absorption you get from this tiny atmosphere is going to give you just a tiny increase in the size of the planet making detecting an Earth-like atmosphere really challenging. Right? So this is a model transmission spectrum of an Earth-like planet. So the planet size is a function of the wavelength that you observe at. And you can see there's these various biosignatures, right? So there's oxygen and two water bands, and there's big methane bands and clouds. But if you focus on the y-axis, you can see how small the increase in the size of the planet is as a function of wavelength. Right? So these numbers change at the level of sub-percent variations, which itself translates into changes in the depth of the transit of about one in one billion. So really, really small. But if we want to detect those really minute variations, we need to observe, one, from space, and two, with a really big and powerful space telescope. And luckily we have one. Coming online, in spring 2019. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. So JWST is a joint NASA, uh, European, Canadian mission, and itself is a 6.5 meter space telescope that is going to give us the most precise measurements of exoplanetary spectra to date. Right? And to prove to you that this is a real thing, here's an image of the primary air settings of JWST taken earlier this summer. So this telescope actually does exist. Right now, it's at the Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas, under our integration of the instruments and telescope components, and going to undergo some vibrational testing and cryogenic testing before being launched in spring 2019. So coming back now to this model of an Earth-like transmission spectrum, I'm going to plot a synthetic measurement taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, or HST. So HST is a 2.4 meter telescope that you've probably all heard of. And to date, it's been the best observatory for taking transmission spectrum of exoplanets. And so this is our synthetic measurement right there. So a measurement of the transit depth with HST at this wavelength. And the large vertical line is the error bar. <laughs> Basically, the uncertainty in the measurement. <laughs> so yeah, so clearly we can't detect anything with HST, at least not for an Earth-like planet, right? But, of course, there's JWST. Right? So JWST represents an increase in precision. We become, so we enter this regime where we might be able to detect these sort of biosignatures in an Earth-like planet. So coming back to our timeline, I better well put JWST on the map. Because it's going to be the best observatory for studying exoplanetary atmospheres in transmission once it's launched in 2019. Okay. So, so, so far, I've talked about transmission software and studying exoplanetary atmospheres. But what about actually imaging a planet? Imaging the surface of a planet. But to do that, you have to detect photons that are actually being reflected by the planet. You can't just take stellar photons <coughs> and stream it through its atmosphere. You have to isolate photons that are coming from the planet itself. Right? And this is 
It's difficult. It's really difficult. But once we do it, at least for Earth-like planets, we want to know whether or not we can measure things like the presence of continents, or oceans, or clouds, or really any sort of large-scale surface features. And to answer the question of whether or not we can do that, let's take a step back and look at what our present imaging capabilities are. So this is a, a movie taken over about a decade or so, with an 8-meter class telescope on the ground of the multi-planet system HR8799. So can anyone tell me how many planets are in this system? Count them. Four. Four. Yeah, there are four planets in this system. Chronos, Chos, Trois, whatever. Sorry. So of course, four planets in this system. And they're all orbiting around their central star, which is this guy right here at the center. And that central star is 10,000 times brighter than any of the HR 8799 planets. So what we have to do is you actually have to mask it. So that's what this black shadowy thing is. It's a mask that we put over the star to try and suppress some of the starlight. But you can still see some of this residual noise, even with the mask there. So the second thing you'll note is that this is a movie taken over about a decade, right? But over this decade, 10 years, these planets all only cross a very small fraction of their orbits, right? It's not like Earth, which would go around 10 times. They're only crossing a small fraction of their orbit because these planets are so far away from their central star. Their orbital periods of, this guy has an orbital period of about 50 years, whereas this guy has one of like 500 years. And that means that these planets are very distant from their star, right? The orbital distance is very large. Meaning that if we want to try an image an Earth-like planet, we have to go, we gotta, we gotta go there, right? That's what the Earth would be in this system, if it were orbiting around the star. And same with Jupiter, right? So an Earth analog or a Jupiter analog are too close to their host star, or too close to this star, to be imaged. They'd be stuck behind the mass. We have no chance of imaging. The reason that we can image these bright guys out here is one, because they are white, and two, because they're very well separated. So even when you're trying to image these types of planets, the HR89, HR8799 types of planets, which are sort of like the easiest ones to do, it's like being in Toronto, but trying to detect a firefly next to a searchlight in Ottawa. <laughs> and that's like the best case scenario. So the question now is, what steps do we have to take in order to one day be able to image an Earth-like planet like this guy here, or at least some planet in the habitable zone? where the habitable zone around this particular star is this ring here. So we really got to push down. And the way we're going to do that is with really big telescopes, right? Or this class of extremely large telescopes, is what the astronomers like to call it, or ELT, right? So what we're looking at now is a suite of both existing and planned telescopes with three ELTs, namely this European extremely large telescope which is actually 40 meters across. So the diameter of its mirror is 40 meters. It's like two and a half basketball courts of magnitude. So there's also the giant Magellan telescope, and there's the 30 meter telescope over here, which actually has some Canadian involvement. But fantastic, right? But so the really big mirrors on board extremely large telescopes give astronomers a big boost in sensitivity, but they also give you better spatial resolution so that you can start to look closer and closer to the star, excuse me, and image planets that might be within the Halbo zone around certain types of stars. So the question now is, what are the best targets for directly imaging potentially habitable planets? So I'm going to try and explain this plot to you, basically just to answer this question. So here we're looking at the star and planet separation. Basically, what's the angle between the star and the planet on the sky? Right? And then the y-axis is the planet and star flux ratio, or basically how bright is the planet relative to the star. And so each of these individual points, sorry, it's really hot. So each of these individual points are synthetic Earth-like planets orbiting within the habitable zone of their host star, where the temperature of the host star is indicated by this color. Right? And the way that you answer the question of whether or not any particular planet is imageable with an extremely large telescope is you just compare its location in this plot 
to this solid curve, where the solid curve is the expected performance or the expected level of performance for imagers on board extremely large telescopes. So any points that lie above this line are sufficiently well separated from their host star and sufficiently bright such that we should be able to image them with an extremely large telescope. And so this little cluster of points here, which lie above the line and are therefore imageable, are actually orbiting around these dark points or these cool stars, which we call red dwarfs. So the red dwarfs are the ones that are very cold, so the habitable zone is at very close distances, right? Whereas these planets, these habitable zone planets orbiting around sunlight stars, they're too dim, right? They all fall below this line. So it looks like we only image habitable zone planets around these red dwarfs, okay? So, because if you want to image planets like this, one important thing to consider is the star-planet separation, or the angle between the planet and the star on the sky. Because that's important, we want to focus on nearby stars. So here's a movie of the known red dwarf exoplanetary systems in the solar neighborhood. So there's the sun there at the center of the image. And this image extends out to about 70 light years. And so you can see that there are only about 25 known exoplanetary systems around red dwarfs within about 70 light years. But there are actually about 2,000 red dwarfs that would fit in this frame. So it means that there are other planetary systems out there, and we just haven't found them. Right? But we're going to find them, and one of the ways we're going to find them is with this transiting exoplanet survey satellite, right? Or test. So TESS is going to be launched in 2018. Yeah, that's right. And TESS is going to find the closest transiting red dwarf planetary system. And it's expected to find about 1,000 of them. And of those 1,000, about 30 are going to be within 70 light years. So about 30 are going to fit in the frame that I showed you here. Okay? But of course, TESS can only find transiting planets, so ones whose orbits are you know, like perfectly heading off. But for habitable zone planets around red dwarfs, only 1% of those planets are actually going to be edge on. So for the other 99%, we have to revert to the radial velocity method. And so here are two upcoming radial velocity spectrographs that are both Canadian led, and I'm a part of, that's why I'm talking about them. There's a few more, but we don't care about them. So there's Spiru, and there's NIRPS. And each of these RV spectrographs are going to conduct a three to five year long planet search around nearby M dwarfs, looking for, sorry, red dwarfs, looking for new exoplanets. And because Spiro is in the north in Hawaii, and NERPS is down here in Chile in the south, together, Spiro and NERPS give us full sky coverage. So we have full access to all the red dwarfs in the solar neighborhood. And Spiro is going to start in early 2018. And you're just going to start in sort of late 2019. And so here now is the distribution after Spiro and Nerds have concluded their planet searches. And so these are based on some simulations that I've written. And so there are about 200 new exoplanets that we know about now, including about 10 that are in the habitable zone and potentially imageable with an extremely large telescope. So let me see right here. So this is 2017. 2023, mm -hmm. 2017, 2023, right? <laughs> so a lot more actual planets that we, um, that we don't know. But so once we can get those directly imaged planets, what the heck can we do with them? Well, one thing that we can do with them is get time-resolved reflection spectrum. So basically a reflection spectrum is the reflectivity of the planet as a function of wavelength. And so if you do this as a function of time, as the planet rotates, you actually see different slices of the planet. And so if you basically take these reflection spectra as the planet does one rotation, you can map out basically a one-dimensional map of the planet's surface. So if you take these spectra and you decompose it into its various components, you might be able to see things that look like continents, and you might be able to see things that look like oceans, and then you can create a one-dimensional map, right? Or a longitudinal map of the planet's surface basically how much land that slice has. So
So a group of astronomers uh, from McGill actually did this for the Earth. They took an Earth satellite called Epoxy, and they turned Epoxy around, and they stared at the Earth for 24 hours, and they observed it like it was an exoplanet. And from that, they were able to basically detect the fraction of the Earth's surface that's covered by land. And so you can see, so here's, here's the model up top, and here in the observation, this is the, the one-dimensional map. So you can see that we clearly detect the Pacific Ocean, and the Americas, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Europe and Asia, and then some combination of Asia and the Indian Ocean. Right? Because remember, it's the one knee map, so you don't have any latitude on the ocean. So this is something that we hope to do with exoplanets, right? We can actually image their surfaces. And so I'm going to throw down on a timeline these RV and these transit surveys that are going to want to find the closest habitable worlds. And then, of course, the commissioning of these extremely large telescopes, which are going to be able to actually image them and maybe image their services. Right? So, so, so far, I've been talking a lot about imaging exoplanets solely around red dwarfs. Remember, because the habitable zone planets are around sunlight stars. They were all below that, can't do it right. they were all below that line, right? There's that contrast between one of the only image planets that are up here, but all the planets around sunlight stars were down here. So really with an ELT, we can only image a habitable zone planet around a red dwarf. But mm -hmm, the habitability around red dwarfs, or the potential for habitability around red dwarfs, has been under a lot of debate lately. And for good reason. So there are a few reasons why habitability around red dwarfs might not work. And one of them is that red dwarfs, like this guy here, they have very long pre-stellar phases. So basically, before contracting down to an adult star, they stay sort of puffed up and very, very hot. And red dwarfs stay like that for like a billion years. And so any red dwarf planet that you find within the habitable zone, if it was there, when the red dwarf was still contracting in its pre-stellar phase, it likely would have been too hot for that planet to be habitable. Right? So this is, this, this is one of a few reasons that red dwarfs, or habitability around red dwarfs, may not work. So really what you want to do is image a true Earth twin. Right? And when I say a true Earth twin, I mean a planet that's the size of the Earth, is orbiting around a sun-like star, and has an orbital period of pretty close to 365 days. And to do that, we can't use ELTs. We have to go into space. Okay? So what I'm showing you here is a, a suite of telescopes, or NASA space missions, that at least have some partial focus in exoplanetary science. So here's Hubble, which you know, we talked about as being the best transmission specter now. And there's TESS, which is going to find the closest habitable planets. And JWST, which is going to give us the best transmission spectrum in a year and a half or so. And then down here, this big question mark. And so in the 2020 NASA Decadal Survey, planets are going to be finalized to fund and build the next big space mission in exoplanetary science. And there are a couple of proposed telescopes. And one of those proposed telescopes I want to talk about is called Mouvoir, or the large ultraviolet optical infrared survey telescope. Okay? And the voir is dope. <laughs> so there are actually there are a number of Canadian astronomers, including myself, which think the voir is like the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and I'm gonna try and convince you why. So firstly, this is Jupiter. Right? So this is Jupiter as seen by the Juno spacecraft, which is this 1.1 billion dollar spacecraft that we sent off to Jupiter. It took five years to get there. It arrived last year. And now that it's there, it can get these ultra high resolution images of the upper cloud decks on Jupiter at a resolution of about 30 kilometers per second. Now, with Mouvoir, which is orbiting basically with the Earth as the Earth goes around the sun, is going to get a comparable resolution. And it's going to be able to get basically the same types of images when Jupiter is at opposition, or basically when the Earth and Jupiter are at their closest approach. And we can do it without having to send a $1.1 billion spacecraft. <laughs> okay. So another dramatic capability of the water 
is illustrated first by looking at this image of Pluto. So this is Pluto as seen with HST in 1994. And here's Pluto with Pluto. Yeah. So this is a really drastic improvement, right? It's not the same as sending a spacecraft to Pluto, which we did with the horizon, but we can achieve images like this of Pluto basically whenever we want. Again, we don't have to send a spacecraft to get great images of this. But when really it comes down to studying the habitability of a true Earth twin, Louvoir is going to give us images like this. So this is a simulated solar system twin at 40 light years away, as seen with a 12 meter version of Louvoir. And it's clear that we can see the Earth. Right? The Earth is there. <coughs> and so this image is absolutely unprecedented. No ground-based extreme large telescope can do this. No other existing or planned space observatory can do this this well. Okay? And so once you can detect this Earth, and the only way that we can do it is by going to space with something like Louvoir, <coughs> once we do that, one day, we might be able to get a spectrum like this. So this is a direct spectrum of a true Earth twin. Right? And this, this is crazy, right? Like this, this is the holy grail of exoplanetary science. If you can get this, you do whatever the heck you can to get it. Right? Because you can actually see biosignatures, right? So there's ozone biosignature, here's a, a steep uh, molecular oxygen uh, absorption feature, and here are these, these water bands. And so these are the types of things that you want to find on a true Earth twin to tell whether or not there might be a biosphere in the and so although this is what we want to do, and this is how we think we're going to do it, before anyone gets too excited with myself, we're going to step back for a second and let's look at the y-axis here. So this is the planet flux to the star flux times 10 to the minus 10. So that means that the star is 10 billion times brighter than the planet. And right now, remember those maps that we just stick on top of the star? Right now, the best math, the best maps that we have can only do about a billion times suppression. So we're still missing a factor of 10. And even those best maps only seem to work in the lab under very idealized conditions. So there needs to be a big step in technology before we can get to a suppression factor of 10 to the 10, or 10 billion, right? And in addition to the planet being much, 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 much dimmer than the star, the planet being 100 light years away is also intrinsically faint. It's actually fainter than some of the faintest galaxies in the Hubble Deep Field, which you may have heard of. So the Hubble Deep Field is one of the deepest optical images that we ever obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we basically took the Hubble Space Telescope, we pointed at a very small piece of sky, and we stared there for days. And so what we saw are each of these are individual galaxies. <coughs> that are very young. So we're staring back into time on the galaxies, basically soon after these galaxies form. And because they're so far away, in both space and time, they're really, really faint. We need hundreds of hours to sit on these things together. And an Earth-like planet, an Earth twin at 100 light years away, like this one, is going to need the same amount of time, hundreds of hours. But if we can detect a true Earth twin, and you better damn well believe that Louvoir is going to take those hundreds of hours to look at it. Because again, this is what we exoplanetary scientists are after. This is the whole thing. Okay. So to finish up, um, I've talked a lot about the James Webb Space Telescope, or the expected capabilities of the you know, James Webb Space Telescope, and extremely large ground-based telescopes, and future space-based observatories like Louvoir. And I hope that I've actually been able to convince you that with observatories like this, the search for life on exoplanets is not all for naught. And then we can actually start to answer questions about habitability outside of our own solar system in the coming decades. So thank you very much, and I'll leave you guys with a final time. Yeah, you're up. Okay, so I, 
I'm pretty sure I heard that the actual reason that people don't think plants around red dwarf stars could be habitable is because the red dwarf stars don't give off enough radiation which trips the atmosphere. Okay, so go ahead. So I actually heard that like the reason why people don't think planets around red dwarf stars can be habitable is because the red dwarf stars gave up so the comment is that uh, one of the reasons that red dwarf stars, or why people think red dwarf stars might not be habitable, in addition to the reason I gave, another reason that Jonathan brought up is that red dwarf stars tend to be very active stars. So you guys have heard of solar cycling, right, where the sun basically ejects these high energy particles, of high energy radiation out towards the Earth, and can bring down you know, power grids. And red dwarfs, many of them tend to do this a lot. They flare up, and you get this big flux of high-energy ultraviolet photons. And that, exactly right, when it interacts with your atmosphere, if you're not protected by you know, a strong magnetic field, high-energy photons can basically get absorbed by things like water in your atmosphere. Then your water molecule breaks apart, and you have hydrogen floating around and oxygen floating around, and the hydrogen basically escapes because it's so light. So basically, you've over-dissociated all the water in your atmosphere, and if you lose water in your atmosphere, you basically turn into Venus. Basically a big carbon dioxide planet. And that's certainly not habitable. So that's a great, yeah, that's a totally valid reason why planets around red dwarfs might not be habitable. Totally agree with that. Yeah? Um, but, so I have a question about, if it takes so long for light to reach one of these
An Earth-like planet around the red dwarf, because red dwarfs are smaller, it's more, it's closer to about a per cent. Right? So if you if you have the if you measure the star's brightness and there's no transit, it's just a constant brightness, right? But if you have a, a transit, you get a little dip. And so what I'm saying is an Earth around the sun, the size of that dip is 0.01%. But for an Earth like that around a red dwarf, it's about one-ish percent. Okay? Then for radial velocity, what you need is a velocity resolution, right? How small, how tiny of the velocity variations can I detect? So the Earth around the sun is 10 centimeters per second. That's the amplitude of that sine curve. It's 10 centimeters per second. And currently, the best instruments are only about one meter per second. So we can detect an Earth around a sunlight star. But an Earth in the habitable zone around a red dwarf star could be a few meters per second, which is bigger than our precision of one meter per second. Okay? Does that help? Cool. Um, I'm going to throw a SETI into the mix. Oh boy! Yeah. Um, using technology that we have today, let's suppose that we were to assemble a space-based laser system 50 years in the future and aim it at every place that we thought was habitable and send a modulated laser beam out of this thing. Maybe have one of them around to get well away from the sun. Uh, so basically a technology we do today. Um, I create the sense, but could we do it? Would these telescopes be able to detect that signal? Yeah, modulated laser. So, so the question is about SETI, or the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And uh, the proposition is that we send, we have uh, an array of... Something we could do, but we were hoping other people did it. So, sorry, is the question that we're going to do it ourselves and we're waiting to hear back, or what? Well, we're looking to hear from Could we hear from somebody who already detected us as a black or anything and they're trying to contact us? So, imagine there's a civilization on some other planet elsewhere in the galaxy and they have this array of lasers and they point it straight at the Earth because they think we're here and they hope that we're here. Um, and so, this is um, it's a cool concept. And it's actually something that we're doing. So we have radio basic broadcasts on the ground that we beam signals to other planets. and. Maybe something comes back, nothing's really come back so far. Um, but so the question is, would we be able to detect if some extraterrestrial civilization was beaming their signal to us? And it, it depends on a number of things, right? It depends on how powerful that laser is to begin with. It depends on how far away that civilization, civilization actually is from our solar system. So it, it's sort of tough to say, but you know, if we can if we can detect gravitational waves. Which are what? Like 10 to capture 10 to 22, 10 to the minus 22? Yeah. Turns yeah. So if we can detect really tiny things like that, then if we want to build the infrastructure to detect these things, I'm sure that we can. But I can't really answer whether or not right now we can do it because it depends so much on the intrinsic properties of the city, which we just don't know. Alright, one more quick question. Okay. You get to pick the last one, right? Right. Um, this may be a bit of a downer, but uh, why are we looking for habitable stars? Because right now, on this planet, we are just at the point of scrapping biology and going into a, you know, digital beings. Now, digital beings, the perfect planet for them would be maybe the moon. They don't need any of the stuff that we're looking for. So, and whether biology stays afterwards or biology is rotten, we don't know at this point. So I just I think the problem to me is that we're looking for something and we have no idea what we should be looking for. Are we Absolutely. looking for friends out there? Or are we looking for a place to move to once we get the capacity to move it three or four times too late? So okay, so uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Okay, so, so the comment is, um, why is it that we're looking for Earth-like life elsewhere in the galaxy when there are other forms of life, be it digital or just biologically different from our own? And how do we know those things don't exist? Or why aren't we looking for them? And typically my response to this sort of thing is we're not looking for other biologies because exactly as you suggested, we don't know what those things look like. Right? I can't look at a planet Look at the atmosphere of some planet 
and see some molecular feature that is a biosignature of the life on that planet. But if that life form is different from our own, then I don't know that it's a biosignature. Yeah. So th this is the problem, right? So we can only try and find what we know to look for. <laughs> and we know to look for biosignatures that we have on Earth. That's why I've been talking about biosignatures that we have on Earth. Because biosignatures for life forms that we're not familiar with, we're not going to recognize it even if we see it. Okay. Um, I feel like a little more than that, but we'll be wrong. Yeah, yeah, Unfortunately, I have to hold you here for a few more announcements before I let you go. First of all, if you had a question for Ryan, you didn't get a chance to answer. We're trying something new this month where we revitalized our Twitter. So if you want to tweet at UT Astro Tours, Ryan will be available for the next few days, although I hope he's taking Thanksgiving. Uh, to answer your question on Twitter. <laughs> and you'll also be 